Crowd Scene. Five years ago, coder Marcus Pearson published his passion project, the indie game called Minecraft. It has since grown from a tiny independent project to a world dominating giant. And not long ago, his studio Mojang was bought by Microsoft for $2.5 billion. Now, on this latest episode of Crowd Scene, Pete and I speak to Russ Clark of London based Payload Studios about the multiplayer combat experience he's designed and crowdfunded, the game TerraTech. Russ's TerraTech was recently featured in the Guardian newspaper as potentially being the next Minecraft. So we hope you join us as Russ shares the ups and the downs of his story and his advice for those of you who also have a project you're just driven to make. You won't get anywhere by just sort of just just waiting for your success to happen. You have to work harder than you thought you knew how to work. Hey there. Hello. Welcome to Crowd Scene, the show about successful crowdfunding campaigns and the people who make them happen. I'm Michael Ogden. And I'm Peter Dean. In each episode of Crowd Scene, we speak with people who have taken a risk by turning an idea of theirs into reality by raising money on a crowdfunding platform. But what did it take to reach their goal? I like to hear the story behind the idea and discover what it meant for them to find success. And I'm interested in how you design and plan a successful campaign, as well as what our guests have learned along the way. We'll talk about some of the factors that can make or break a campaign. In this episode, we're joined in the studio by Russ Clark, founder of game developer Payload Studios and lead developer of the game TerraTech. TerraTech is a physics-based game about exploring an alien planet, mining resources, and blowing stuff up. But it's not a typical video game. As you explore worlds, you're inventing, finding resources, and building vehicles. And in that sense, it's not unlike a new kind of Lego. It's received praise from both the gaming world and mainstream media. The Guardian newspaper in the UK even suggested it could be the next Minecraft. So Russ set out to raise £35,000 on Kickstarter to bring TerraTech to life. And by the end of the campaign, more than 1,600 backers took the total over £39,000. That's around $60,000. So let's find out how he did it. So Russ will be sharing his insights and crowdfunding advice throughout the show. But first, let's hear his story. Russ Clark, thanks for joining us. Hey, guys. It's great to be here. (laughs) Thanks for coming. And congratulations on a successful campaign. Thank you very much. Well, let's set the scene. Russ, how would you describe TerraTech to someone who hasn't heard of it before? So you did a great job already of giving a pretty good intro. But um, if I had to do it in three words, I would probably say Lego with guns. Whoa, <laughs> that's way guns. better than my description. Yeah. I go with guns. I feel like we should pause, stop the show, go play this game. <laughs> yeah. Feel free. That's a good pitch. What if you had to do it with 11 words? <laughs> you might have to yeah, give sorry. me five minutes to, yeah. to count. <laughs> All right. So actually in the intro, I said Guardian saying, hey, it's the next, it could be the next Minecraft. Hmm. Is this the next Minecraft? Uh, oh, absolutely. Without any question, um, I'm going to be coining it. So uh, yeah. Drinks are on me, guys, <laughs> in, in about five years' time. Uh, I, I know, I, I'd love to think so. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, when we first started exploring the idea, it was clear to us that it had the potential to be something really massive. But obviously, there are a lot of other great developers out there with some amazing games. Mm. And, you know, there's only one Minecraft. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't know. I don't like to get too attached to sort of grandiose phrases like that. Yeah. But um, it certainly could be something really special. It's already something pretty special. I mean, to um, what do you attribute the popularity of games like Minecraft and, and TerraTech? What, what is it about that's special? Um, there's a very particular mix of elements. Uh, it's got a lot to do with creativity. Um, Minecraft is perhaps the best example of a relatively new trend of games that are really designed around the creativity of the players. So the, the game experience is formed not so much by um, some game designer's preconceived ideas of, you know, this is the, the, the progression you're going to go through for these steps exactly. It's more about here is a box of toys that you can play with and build a story of your own, uh, which obviously then brings the, the player into the equation of, of defining what the, what, what, how the thing is going to unfold. And that's an incredibly powerful thing if you manage to channel it. So I understand that Minecraft is assembling blocks of things and you're building structures of various sorts. Mm. How is TerraTech similar to that? So Minecraft is a game that's based around what's called a voxel engine, which basically means that the world is entirely constructed out of uh, three-dimensional cubes in much the same way as a two-dimensional image is constructed out of square pixels. Uh, You are 
able to, you're presented with this pre-generated world that's made in that way and you're able to remodel it to your heart's content by mm-hmm. adding and removing blocks of different kinds. Um, Terratech in a way kind of turns that on, on its head where in Minecraft you are a simple avatar that moves around a world which you remodel as you see fit. In Terratech um, you, you remodel yourself. Uh, okay. So the Terratech world is actually, it's not a blocky world, it's not a voxel engine. It's a smooth undulating landscape with different regions that are generated by algorithms to create a different sort of feeling uh, and different challenges in each area. Mm-hmm. And then you start out the game with a very simple modular vehicle that you've made out of roughly square bricks. Um, there'll be a, a basic block and there'll be a, a cab, which is where your, your driver sits, and then a few wheels maybe a drill to go on the front and perhaps a gun to defend yourself. Mm. Each of those is a, a block that you stick on to make this basic car mm. uh, and you can drive it around. Um, the, the, the conceit is that you are a miner. You're a space miner sent to an alien planet to find natural resources and sell them. And on that planet, you encounter lots of other competing miners who've all also got modular vehicles made out of different blocks. Mm. So while you're trying to fulfill your mission, you're also defending yourself against these other guys. And uh, as you get into scraps with them, anytime you do some damage, you might knock off a brick from one of the others, which you can then immediately pick up, stick it on your own vehicle Mm. uh, and power yourself up. So Mm -hmm. you get immediately that satisfaction of shooting a gun off the other guy, sticking it on and then finishing him off with his own weapon. So it's quite environmentally friendly in that respect. You're recycling the uh, the, the debris of uh, other people's broken I, down. I, I try not to think too deeply about the environmental <laughs> environmental message we're we're sending by teaching kids to strip mine virgin planets. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure there's a lesson in there somewhere. Yeah. Well, can we go back to the very very start, which is the inception of the idea? How did that come to be? What was that day? Um. The, the day, it's quite funny. Um, so in late 2012, mm-hmm. uh, I, I'd been working for seven years at a company called uh, IdeaWorks, mm-hmm. um, which is a, a mobile games and technology developer, which is now called Marmalade. Um, and they have switched their focus really to just being purely tech development. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I worked there during a time uh, when there was a sort of split between tech development and games development. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this game studio sort of grew up in parallel with the the mobile revolution um, that uh, of, of, of iPhone and, and before that. Um, and I had um, a lot of great times there and did some really cool projects. Mm. But I realized around that, actually a little earlier than that time, probably 2011, that um, the way that technology was going um, and the way that the tools available for people to, to make games were advancing, there was an incredible opportunity arriving for anyone who had a rough idea what they're doing to just launch out and um, be able to succeed at making video games, Mm. which is really my my greatest ambition. And I realized that I was never going to be able to fulfill that ambition um, while while working for someone else, especially not a company that, you know, a big part of its focus was on making technology rather than video games. Mm -hmm. So I decided around that time uh, that I was going to quit and, um, and go it alone. Well, and, and try and start something rather than go it alone. Um, was that after great debate? Was this a gamble? It, it was a debate that had been going on in my head of, you know, continuously for a period of years. Um, it was more, you know, when, when you stay at a company for more than three or four years, I think it's important that you ask yourself every so often, why am I still here? You know, and, and every year I asked myself that idea because I was able to come up with a good answer. My role had changed. I was learning new things. I was, yeah. you know, getting getting a useful knowledge that would be good for me later. And when it got to the point where I couldn't really justify staying any longer, I, I left. Um, but instead of just finding another job somewhere else, I thought, you know, this is the time. This is a time when, you know, amazing things could, could be done. I, I want to get a piece of that before I'm too old to take risks. <laughs> Did you leave with the idea of a terror take in your head? Or did you leave and... Uh... No, not at all. I actually left with a completely different idea in my head that I'd been sort of bubbling for about a year um, that I thought uh, could could be really interesting. And I had a, a prospective business partner, a guy I knew in, in Santa Monica, um, that uh, I thought I might work with. So this was in the world of games. It wasn't like, I'm going to write that musical no, it now. Was, it was absolutely... I mean, <laughs> games are, are, are my passion. And that was always, you know, what, what I wanted to do with myself. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I, I quit... Um, in order to devote myself fully to this. Um, and, uh, well, the, the, the short version is for the next six to nine months, I was, you know, doing, doing pitches and presentations, trying to raise money, working on a prototype and, and trying to get this thing off the ground. Mm. Um, 
And uh, it didn't happen. I couldn't, I was not able to convince people that this was an exciting thing worth, worth putting money into, even though the vision in my head seemed very clear. Yeah. I, I couldn't get it across. Yeah. Um, you probably didn't have that three word pitch at that time. I, I spent a lot of time working on the elevator pitch, you know, which is, we all know is a very important thing. And, um, it just, it just didn't quite work, even though I had a, a, a demo. Yeah. Um, and I got to a point, it was around, it was around the, uh, start of the summer of the next year. Uh, I'd, I'd recently come back from the GDC conference in America, which is the big games industry development conference that everyone goes to, especially to do business and pitch ideas. Mm-hmm having basically struck out. Um, and I felt quite down mm. uh, and I was losing confidence as well in my in my business partner. There was nothing wrong with him. It was mm. just that it was that classic problem of an unequal situation. I had quit my job and was scraping by on bits of consultancy. Mm. He was still in his job, which meant that he could only put the occasional weekend and evening in. Mm. And it's just with the best of intentions, yeah. it's very hard for that to, to work out. Um, so I didn't really know what to do. And um to cheer myself up, I, I decided I'd just put it out of my head and do some programming for fun. Mm-hmm. And I dug up this um, this uh, prototype that I'd been messing around with in the couple of weeks after I left my previous job mm. uh, and thought, well, I'll just play with that for a bit. Um, and that that was actually the original prototype for Terratech. I hadn't been really thinking about doing it seriously. It was just a, a fun idea. Um, and yeah, I, I spent a couple of weeks noodling with it. I managed to solve a core problem that I hadn't solved before, which was how to build something in three dimensions using a two dimensional interface, a drag and drop interface of dragging blocks with a mouse, mm. which would also work potentially with a finger on a, on mm-hmm. a touch screen. Mm. Um, and, uh, I, I, I solved that and suddenly I realized that it was really fun mm. as it was really fun. And, 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 and yeah. I got very excited um, and it was around that time that I happened to go to a networking event organized by uh, Tiger, which is one of the trade industry associations mm-hmm. in the UK for, for games. Mm-hmm. Um, and there I met a guy called uh, Vincent Chura, mm-hmm. um, who is, uh, he's uh, had a, an independent legal practice that specializes in games for the last um, uh, more than a dozen years. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he's a, you know, a, a great uh, proponent of the industry and mm-hmm. a very uh, a guy who gets very excited about creativity and the ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was looking for projects to get involved in from the business side, having done a lot of legal work, he was really wanting to get a bit more involved in the actual journey of, of growing a company and making something mm. happen. And we just sort of found each other. You know, he was looking for something for someone like me and I, I desperately needed someone like him. Yeah. Um, and uh, we started talking about what we could do. And that was, well, that was almost exactly two years ago. Let me ask you this. During those times when you were uh, beginning to get, feel a bit desperate, what kept you motivated? Um, well, I would, to be honest, I was losing motivation. Um, you know, you take this big risk and you start telling people, I've got these plans and maybe we're going to move out to West Coast USA and so on. And then you start thinking, oh, what are they going to think when I have to say, yeah, that didn't work out. I'm still here. I might just go and get another job. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to look at yourself in the mirror sometimes. You know, as I said, I, I got quite down about it mm-hmm. and I, I just wanted to do some programming to cheer myself up. And mm-hmm. that's what brought me back. Mm. to Terratech. E- even then I would say that, um, you know, that stuff affects you emotionally. Mm. And, um, e- even after things were starting to take off with Terratech, it was actually several months, I think, before I started to really feel the same enthusiasm and excitement that I had since I, um, since, since I left the, the job, mm. just, just because it takes a while to, for that belief to really start, yeah. um, building up again. At that point, were you starting to build a team, uh, of other programmers, yeah. So, so the focus after Vincent and I started talking seriously, um, the, the the focus for the next few months was finance and team to get something going. Yeah. Uh, so, for the finance part, uh, we started speaking to friends and family who might be interested in you know some small scale seed finance to get things going. And for the team part, it was a question of reaching out to people that each of us knew. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we weren't able to take anyone on full time at that stage, mm-hmm. but. We were lucky enough to make contact with a guy called Jolyon Webb, uh, who was an art director at Blitz Games based in Leamington, who had just uh, just gone into liquidation at that time. Mm. Um, many of the um, many of the staff there were able to join the reformed 
Radiant Worlds, mm -hmm. uh, which is now doing very well with a game called um, Sky Saga. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, two thirds of them had to go. And this guy, Jolyon, who's an amazingly talented art director, um, was, was looking around for things to get involved with. And he, he couldn't work with us full time, but he was able to play an absolutely crucial role in helping us to define an early art style and approach to some of the unique technically artistic challenges mm. of of Terratech mm. and also to help us um, find uh, a network of outsource contractors mm -hmm. to start doing early concept art and, and test modeling for some of the, the game assets. Um, so al although he, he no longer works with us, you know, he, he had to, well, he, he found a job at Natural Motion mm. um, that was in line with, uh, you know, his, his career needs. Um, he, he did play an essential role in the startup of the company. I'm curious, so you, you were a skilled programmer, but did you feel like there were skills that you didn't have that you needed to find? Of course, of course. I mean, in the world of indie games development, there are a few incredible individuals who are actually capable of doing everything themselves. Uh, I have boundless respect for those people. I don't even really understand how they can do that. Um, you know, I come from a background of larger scale studio game development where there is more specialization. And even though um, multi-talented people are something that, that we tend to prize quite highly in, the, in that area, um, it's very rare to have someone who ticks all the boxes. Yeah. So what I bring to the table is programming ability and some design direction ability mm -hmm. and, you know, experience of, 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 of managing teams and, and running a mid-size operation. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have, I don't have artistic ability and I certainly don't believe that I could do a, a project of any scale completely on my own, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I was looking to get together a few key people in the, in the main development disciplines of art design and, and some more programming. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then also once we have that core in place, then look for someone to help with production, mm -hmm. which is the games industry word for project management. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, various other key components that we needed. One of the most important w of which was actually PR. Um, people often raise their eyebrows when I talk about this because uh -huh. they think of PR as a sort of a sort of nasty corporate thing, and indie <laughs> development as the as the opposite of that. But you know the the, the world of, of the indie scene has evolved very rapidly in in recent years, and actually, you know, um, maintaining your Building and maintaining your your public relationship with players and building a community is probably the most important aspect now mm -hmm. of getting any indie game project uh, off the ground. Yeah. So, what exactly does the PR your PR people do? So, we're lucky enough to work with a PR consultant called Natalie Griffith, uh, who works with various um, small scale indie teams, and I'd mm -hmm. recommend to anyone. Um, and uh, she was one of the earliest people that we started to get involved with. Uh, we, we, uh, we had this idea that we thought was very important of building up a, a community-driven project, which was where the, rather than sort of working for years and then suddenly coming out with some massive thing that you try and sell to people, mm. um, iterating gradually, scaling things up uh, and building the community as you go along. Mm. Uh, and so Natalie consulted with us from the early days in how to actually achieve that, what were the key components, how to build a strategy that would allow us to get the right kinds of publicity at different stages mm. Um, to to realize that vision. So at what point did you think, I mean, it sounds like you went from not quite knowing what to do, feeling like you'd uh, disappointed yourself or other people by not moving to the West Coast of America. Then you had this <laughs> gem of an idea, which you, which seemed like it, it built up quite quickly once it, things started moving. Um, at what point did you think, well, I now I need to, I need another chunk of money. I need to crowdfund this. Um, so crowdfunding was something that we had talked about from the, the relatively early days. So if it was summer 2013 that I met Vincent and we started talking about forming a company and, and raising some seed finance, it was probably by autumn that we were talking about Kickstarter. Obviously at that time, there were there had been a lot of very noticeable successes in the game sphere and, and others. Um, and there hadn't been too many disappointments yet. <laughs> so there was this sort of, uh, you know, uh, wonderful aura about the whole thing. And uh, it seemed like something that would could be a good route but it was also very clear to us that it was not something to take lightly. So it was really a question. And also, we, we were hedging our bets a little bit. We weren't quite sure how the, the, the finance life cycle of the, of the game was going to work. It could have been 
that we would do a deal with a publisher mm -hmm. and that they would not want us to be beholden to a bunch of Kickstarter backers. Yeah. So Kickstarter was one of the routes and we felt that if we did go that route, it was really a question of finding the right timing and of working out how much preparation we would have to do and how long that would take. Yeah. And that was a question that we, we uh, turned over for several months actually. And it wasn't until uh, early 2014 that we worked out a rough timeline for that. Is there a reason why you chose Kickstarter as opposed to any other crowdfunding platform? Um, I would say mainly because it was the, the biggest in terms of exposure and in terms of funds raised and because there were notable examples of video game projects that had succeeded there. I want to quickly ask you about the name, TerraTech. Mm -hmm. Who came up with the name and were there any other contenders? Um, I came up with the name. Uh, there were other contenders. Coming up with names for things is one of my least favorite jobs in in-game development. <laughs> I love coming up with names for things. <laughs> well, I can't stand it. it. It's a bit like coming up with a name for a band. Yes, you know, it's exactly. just no one can ever agree and it's a horrible process of like there's never really any backup for any ideas that you have and you just end up reeling off lists of these things that everyone goes no 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 <laughs> wait um, a second did you used to be in a band as well no i didn't oh, yes you no, did I, you can tell no no no, no. what was the name I really, of that really, band? i really didn't but uh you know I, I maybe i saw that in a film i don't know um, the band was called Terratech. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everything I've ever made. Russ Terratech and the Terratech Five. <laughs> yeah, so I had this name. Yeah. <laughs> I already had the t-shirts. He post-rationalized a whole game out of it. Yeah. Uh, but the name, like like so many uh, uh, other kind of individual concepts in a video game, it was a placeholder that I just came out with in order to have something to write on the documents, really. <laughs> Uh, thinking we'll we'll do this properly later, yeah. and then when we went brainstorming later for a better name, you know, we spent a couple of weeks bouncing things back and forward and couldn't come up with anything better, and just thought, well, actually that's all right, you know, it's alliterative, it sort of relates to what you do in the game, yeah. it's easy to yeah. remember, yeah, and it stuck. It yeah. So how many months passed between you going, I think we should do this Kickstarter and it going live? So, if uh, if it was. January 2014 that we decided we were almost certainly going to do one and, and, and made our plan. Uh, it went live at the end of June 2014. Okay. So, so five or six months. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it, we delayed it a little bit. We had thought initially that we might try and do it around April, May. Okay. And it just took us um, quite a long time to get everything lined up. Mm -hmm. Well, can you talk us through some of the pre-campaign work you did and give us your, how about three bits of advice? Yes, yes. If or you could. people probably say, give us 11 bits of advice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> sure yeah. on, uh, on how you planned and organized the campaign. Yeah, so um, I, I would say the, the most important thing um, was and is community building. Um, the success of a, a Kickstarter campaign is really a function of the, the quality and excitement of what you're offering and you, how you present it multiplied by the social reach that you're able to achieve, yeah. right? It's, it's how good it is and how many people you can get it in front of. Um, so it's very important to have a, a broad community that you can reach when you go live with the campaign, and that can take a long time to, to build up. So that was the sort of main critical path item, I guess, uh, for us to get ready. Mm. Um, and, you know, we, we, we invested a lot of time in doing that. Um, as I mentioned community is a is a central pillar mm. of our of our approach anyway uh so we spent months uh you know taking early demos of the game to live shows and putting it in the hands of people mm -hmm. um working on social media um you know spreading spreading the word that way mm -hmm. um talking to other people in the development community mm -hmm. uh and you know looking for opportunities to get um get articles mm -hmm. interviews anything like that just to spread the word and get people interested in in this thing we were making yeah teasing teasing assets and, and, and that yeah. kind of stuff i mean that's a lot of work to do um was there something that was the most that kind of proved the most effective in terms of building that audience yeah i would say i would say probably one of the, the biggest factors was doing a, a public free a free public release of a, a technical demo of the game oh, okay. so we took the prototype demo build that we had exhibited at several shows uh tried to stabilize it a little bit and make it quite flexible and then we released that completely free on a, a website called indiedb.com mm -hmm. uh, which is a great resource for 
startup indie developers who've got a concept and they want to get people to know about it. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a sort of hub for a community to form and find out about new things. And it's got a sort of slightly Reddit style um, uh interface of things bubbling up to the top mm -hmm. where they're popular so mm. you know you can you can catch a little wave there mm -hmm. uh, we, we had that um demo on indb for a, a couple of months i think before we started our campaign okay and you know in that time it had oh uh, twelve thousand downloads or something right which mm -hmm. is not, not bad numbers yeah. for, for that did that feel like a big moment when you put that on indb it was it was yeah it was it's a big moment i mean you, you don't know what's going to happen when you do something like that so um you just you just hope for the best, but it was it, it proved very important for us. Would you would you say it would be impossible to raise money for something like this without a, a working demo? Um, it's not impossible. Um, for example, uh, you know, a, a recent Kickstarter success, a very big one, was a, a game called Exploding Kittens. Mm -hmm. um, it's not um, it's not a, a video game; it's a card game. Um, but you know that achieved spectacular success without really any sort of uh, interactive simulation of the product. Mm. It was just very, very well presented mm. and well structured. They made like $9 million or something it was, crazy. It was like crazy, mm. absolutely crazy. But, you know, if you want an example of how to do a Kickstarter project right, mm. look no further. Um, so your campaign goal was £35,000. Where did that figure come from? Um it was it was a tricky one. Um, to be honest, it was really based on what we thought we could make. Um, there is a, a piece of advice about planning Kickstarters that has been floating around since the early days mm -hmm. that you should um, you should attempt to raise what you actually need to make the project. I don't think that's been valid for several years now. Certainly not in the world of, of video right. games mm -hmm. because it's just not realistic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most people know most people who know anything about development know that that video game projects um take tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds to to make if you've got yeah. you know a certain level of quality and ambition mm. and it's very hard to raise that kind of money on kickstarter mm. unless you have some major assets behind you like an ip that everyone has heard of or a, a storied developer you know that with, with, with a long background or or some other major advantage like maybe Maybe you've got a massive community that you can draw on from another game that you own or something. Mm -hmm. you know? If you're coming from nowhere, you're unknown, and you've got a new thing that people haven't heard of, you know, mm. it's really difficult to get into that kind of territory. So I think you have to be realistic. We, we looked, um, the, 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 the third piece of pre-campaign advice I would, I would give after yeah. community building and, and doing a free demo is do your research really thoroughly. Mm -hmm. um, and we made sure that we looked back at a long previous history of successful game kickstarters yep. and use those as our reference points for what we could achieve and also how we had to structure and present things um and we determined that you know probably around the 30 to fifty thousand mark was what we might be able to attain mm -hmm. um and uh you know it's, it's better to raise a good chunk of that than to shoot for all of it and get nothing because you don't hit the target yes yeah. before the campaign went up you were building your community were you Telling your community, hey, this is coming up. We're going to launch this, and absolutely, yes, okay. yeah, um, yeah. It, it's important to build up that anticipation so that everyone knows it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Because when you go live, you need to build the biggest rush you possibly can mm -hmm. of all the people you can reach yeah. getting involved mm -hmm. to bubble it up into the into the top charts, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that you can then start to get discovery happening within the Kickstarter network. And well, we want to so hear on. about the campaign those thirty days, and we're going to take a, a, a short break in a second. But before we do that. Just before you went live with your campaign, can you put us there in the room? You know, where were you? Who were you with? What were you thinking? So we were we were in our office in in Hammersmith, mm -hmm. um, a very small office it was then, one one room I think, mm -hmm. uh, just big enough for one table, which was definitely too small for the five people sitting around it. <laughs> um, yeah, how are we, you paying your bills for that for that, for that office? Um, so we were paying that out of the initial seed finance that we had. Okay. Um, and it was important that it didn't cost too much. Yeah. And, but it was, you know, around the time when we started the Kickstarter campaign, we were, we were getting low on our reserves. And so we, we needed that money to come in to, to keep us going. Mm -hmm. So naturally, there was a bit of tension in the air. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was, you know, it was the core team of us there. And, and Nat, um, who had, you know, been absolutely pivotal throughout the whole process of, of getting ready for this. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we 
we tried to time the start of the campaign thinking about the time of day of the end of the campaign which is yeah. the same time of day uh to try and make sure that it was a time when we'd have a lot of people online that we were able to reach if we needed a final a final push yeah. mm-hmm. so it was a it was a sunday at about 6 p.m i think okay um that's smart so it was not a weekday yeah, yeah. Generally, with all these things, you know, uh, not just you know Kickstarter campaigns, but you know, promote sale promotions and all those kind of things. Yeah. it's the weekend where you have the most activity. Did you feel the stakes were high? Did you feel like there was a, a level of this has got to work? Yeah, there was a huge amount of that. I mean, the stakes weren't just high in in an existential sense of you know we're going to run out of money and then what do you do? But also on an emotional level, um, you know, you've, you've and it wasn't just me by this point. There was there was a few other guys who'd quit their jobs and come to do this with me. And everyone's got that feeling of, you know, once we've done this Kickstarter campaign, we, we're blowing this massive trumpet for everyone to see, which means everyone's going to see us fail if we don't make it. And yeah. then if I have to crawl back into some job, you know, everyone will be really nice about it, but they'll know. And how do I feel about that? When you're talking about building a community and you, you put the game up, a, a working demo so people could download it, you said 12,000 people downloaded it. Were you just letting them have at it or did you give it away for free in exchange for an email address that you could then use to sort of push messages at them? Um, we, we didn't try to collect anything like that. Uh, I'm not completely sure whether we thought about that and decided we didn't want to introduce any barriers mm-hmm. or, uh, or, or, or not. Um, what we did do, however, was we added, um, we updated the the free build to include a button that you could click while playing the game that yeah. would take you straight to our Kickstarter campaign. Ah, okay. Which um, which proved to be very significant. Yes, so I'll, I I'll tell you later. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take a short break here. When we come back, we're going to hear about the highs and lows of Russ's thirty day campaign. Hi, everybody. If you run a successful crowdfunding campaign on any platform and would like to share your story on this show, please get in touch with me and Pete at hello at crowdsceneshow.com. You can find more information about this episode on crowdsceneshow.com. And if you're into social media, follow us on Facebook and Twitter at crowdsceneshow. If you like this podcast, be sure and subscribe and please share it with friends however you can. And a review on iTunes helps us a lot too. Thanks. So we're here in the studio talking with Russ Clark about how he crowdfunded his game TerraTech. So Russ, can you tell us about your backers? Who are they and why do you think they responded so positively to TerraTech? Um, so, I mean, I mentioned before that, you know, probably one of the, the big factors was was the community building that we did for months in advance. Um, a, a large proportion, especially of the initial backers, were, were those people who, mm. you know, we had, they'd had a lot of time to mess around with our um, our early demo build. Some of them had found us at one of the trade shows that we showed the game at. Um, you know, there's a special um, quality to those people who found you before anyone else has heard of you. They, they have an extra yeah. degree of loyalty, I think, mm-hmm. and they really want you to succeed. Mm-hmm. Um, there was also a lot of support we had from within the industry, both the mainstream industry and the, the indie game dev community. You yeah. know, that, that community survives on the basis of people helping each other out. Um, so there's always a lot of, um, there's always a lot of support there. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, you've got your, your, your friends and family also that you reach out to. Um, so there was a lot of those people, um, getting us started. And then we had, we had a reasonably good initial few days, um, enough to get us into the kind of top 10, 20, mm-hmm. uh, Kickstarter projects, depending on which category you look at. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really important because then you start to get a lot of internal discovery. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, so I think um, in a final event, more than 20% of our backing um, had come from through internal discovery within Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. So a lot of that was just the Kickstarter community, you know, looking out for interesting new, new yeah. projects. Is that, was, that enough, was that enough to put you over the top of your goal? Um, it wasn't, no. Uh, we, ah. we, we had it like so many projects, we had a strong start yeah. and then it tailed off into a plateau mm-hmm. and, um, that in itself was not necessarily that, that, that worrying, you know, everyone tells you before you start, what you're going to see is you're mm-hmm. going to see an initial surge and then it'll sort of climb gradually. Mm-hmm. And then at the end you can get another surge about the same as the one at the start. Mm-hmm. And so as the, as the project wore on, we were looking at the curve and, and, mentally taking that starting curve and copy pasting it to the end and noting that it did not cross the line. Ah. Um, mm. 
and thinking, um, mm. what are we going to do? Uh, and uh, in the end, <clears throat> through a, a series of interesting events, um, we we managed to have a final surge that was double what the initial surge was and which carried us over the line with with 10% to spare. Well, what were some of those interesting events? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you asked. Um, yeah, so the most significant one by far uh, was that the um, the free demo that we had released on IndieDB, we managed to get this released um, on Steam. We, mm-hmm. we, we had been approved uh, for sale on Steam uh, because uh, one of the guys at Valve had seen the project and, and really liked it. And for the benefit of our listeners who don't know what it is, could you just explain? Yes, Steam? so S- Steam is the primary um, digital distribution platform for video games on, on PC and Mac. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's the you know it's the has the lion's share of the of the PC games market, and it's the sort of default way to digitally get games. Right. Um, and it, yeah, it's it's you know it, it's a, it's a massive thing. It had, currently has a, a user base of something like 150 million people, I think. Um, so it's it's very important. Was it a big deal that you got on Steam? It was a huge deal. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> firstly, it was a massive compliment that we were invited to sell the game and not have to go through the green light process which is a thing that they created in order to deal with the massive volumes of people applying to sell their their products right so it's it's kind of a a community sort of verification process that uh, they use to kind of get a sense of what projects are uh, Mm. are popular Mm. Uh, we didn't have to do that and that meant that we were able to just make our own app page Mm -hmm. even even you can do this even before you release the game uh, and you can you can put a demo on there. So we had taken our NDDB de- demo, uh, done a bit more work on it, and, a, and sent it through to Steam for approval. And with about six days to go before the end of the campaign, that was approved. Um, so this was on the I think it was yeah it was on the Tuesday before our of our final week yeah. with the project ending on a Sunday. And I I cannot really describe how how important that was for us in in so many ways. First of all. Well, I, I guess the, the the thing that was so great about the timing um, was that at that time, the way that the front page of the Steam site worked, and it doesn't work this way anymore, I think, mm. um, is that the most recent three new game demos appear on the front page mm, and they get wow. pushed out by new ones. Um, and games tend to uh, tend to announce things and release things towards the end of the week, mm. Fridays, Saturdays, you know, that's where the most activity is. Yep. So our demo um, popping up on a Tuesday had basically about four days on the front page of Steam Perfect. Uh, with people clicking through. Uh, and, you know, in, in that six days, I think we had about 15,000 downloads, which was more than we'd had. That is crazy timing, Steam. though, to like, without that, did you, do you feel like you wouldn't have crossed the finish I, line? I don't think we would, no. No, that, that, was, that was what did it. We, um, I mean, you can, when you look at the graph, you can see the inflection point where that happened. And we weren't perhaps quite aware of how significant it would be right but yeah we, we knew within a within a couple of hours i think but given that you couldn't count on that did you have a plan b or a plan c um yeah you know there's the the the, the other plan is just the kind of usual desperate um last minute you know encouragement of people to help you out yeah there's mm. the, the the twitter campaign there's i mean there are some inbuilt mechanisms within mm. kickstarter mm-hmm. like the 48 hour yeah. reminder email um, it was going to be a case of just exhorting everybody to try and dig yeah. a bit deeper to push us over the line, seeing if there's any people we could contact who might be um, willing to, um, you know, up their their donations, that kind of thing. But it was it was touch and go. And I mean, you know, when you're when you're the leader of a team like that, you you have to stay strong for everyone else. Yeah. But there's no one else there to really pick your spirits up. So mm. yeah, inside me, it was there was a bit of a bit of a turmoil going on at that point at that point did you feel like i wish i did a, i would i wish i'd done something differently yeah you, you know you can always find things you could have done differently i mean there's plenty of of stuff you know there, there are things that are very important to do in a in a kickstarter campaign which we had tried to do and, and could have done a better job of and so obviously i was i was thinking about those things i yeah. noticed that um on your campaign page the very highest level of reward you offered was a thousand pounds um and someone did did choose that but yes i find that a lot of uh, campaigns have much higher higher levels sometimes it's just yeah. a, a crapshoot they're just desperate for someone to click it and you know, they, Five, why ten. not 
But sometimes people do go for those things. If, if mm. you get that one person with a lot of money to spare and they're really enthused about what you're doing, mm-hmm. were you, did you ever regret that you didn't make any much higher levels? No, I don't think, I don't think it would have made a difference. No. Uh, I think, you know, if you look at the projects where those higher level tiers get taken, they're projects that have a lot of interest already. If you look at, for example, the Elite Kickstarter, mm. that is a, a very famous, well-known uh, video game franchise with a long history. Yeah. And when they announced that they were doing a new Elite, that was obviously a massive event. Mm. So not only could they count on larger numbers, but within that they could count on some people who would be very motivated to have the status of being a very high right. level backer. Mm-hmm. So it was very sensible for them to have to, you know, some much more expensive tiers than that. And obviously when you're when you're creating those those reward tiers, you have to make sure that that the status part of it is the most important part. So you have to make sure you're get you're giving people something that's not just not just a great experience, mm-hmm. whether it's, you know, come and meet the team or be in a design meeting or whatever, mm-hmm. but also gives them some form of of badge which they can display to other people in the community so everyone will know. Right. It, you know, it's the it's mm-hmm. um it's it's curve based monetization. It's similar to monetizing free to play products. It's it's all about status. Mm. So those tough days um, during your campaign when you thought mm, we might not make it. I mean, what was the best day of your campaign? The best day was the Saturday before the end when we realized we were going to make it, mm. and we were in this this big rush. You know, with the this, the Steam demo was out. We had all that exposure. The final 48 hours email had gone out, so we were getting lots of support on Twitter and elsewhere, people kind of cheering us on. Mm-hmm. And we decided um, we'd go into the office that day and just do a bit of live streaming. We'd recently been experimenting with broadcasting on Twitch TV, uh, which is something that we, we, we still do even, even more of, actually. It's been very good to us. Um, Can you describe what that is? Um, so there's a, 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 a real-time uh, video streaming service called Twitch uh, where it's a little like YouTube, but but live. So you can go and broadcast and people can watch you. And you know, it, it's very big for certain things. Um, uh, League of Legends games and, you know, a, a lot of things like that. Mm. But also there are some developers like us who will actually stream their game development process, which has been a, a, one of the many important aspects of our community-driven approach. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, this was in the early days for us of doing that, yeah. but we thought we'd go in, um, we'd we'd just do a bit of streaming on Saturday afternoon to keep some energy going, and we'd also do an AMA on Reddit at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, Ask and, me anything. And try and get some synergy. That's right, yeah. Um, so we, we did that, and it worked much better than we were expecting, and we found that within an hour or two, we had about double the highest viewers we'd ever had before on Twitch. Mm which was still not massive in our mm-hmm. case. I mean, this mm-hmm. was about 70 or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and we we doubled up to the number one AMA on, on, on Reddit at that, at that time. And oh, we had wow. loads of questions coming in. I think it, it was, it worked very well because there were, there were just, there was just two of us in the office at, at the time, yeah. me and um, my lead designer, Chris. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were, one of us was able to do each and we were kind of bouncing things back and forward. Mm-hmm. So we'd read a question and then we'd answer it on the stream uh, and then people would say things on the stream that we'd kind of push back into the Reddit thread and right. it, it kind of, they, they built each other up. Yeah. 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 So yeah, we, we, we were there for about, we, we'd been there for about three hours yeah. and we were looking at the, the Kickstarter graph climbing up and we realized that we were, we were going to cross the line. Fantastic. So we felt that we, we just had to continue with the broadcast and the AMA until that point because we couldn't stop yes. just before it crossed so the did line. Did that happen live on Twitch? It did, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. After about six hours. <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you pass six hours like, oh a, like a sort of a funding marathon? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, we managed to, to stay conscious, you know, before, before collapsing. It was, wow. you know, it was one of the most physical experiences yeah. in my, my game development career. I mean, yeah. was it a punch the air moment? It absolutely was. Yeah, it was a, it was a major high-fiving uh, occasion. We, what we actually did when we realized that was going to happen, um, we managed to get all of the other current members of the team to, to Skype in. Mm. So that on the Twitch video, we had the two of us in the office and then we had, um, we had all the other people like, oh, like the fantastic. Brady Bunch all kind of like looking at each other <laughs> in different, different windows. Um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. And was what, amazing. what did you guys celebrate? Did you go out in the town? 
Well, we still had a day to go. This was on the Saturday. Okay. So that right. was amazing. Mm. And, you know, we floated home. And then the next day we came back to the office with a few more people. And we just did a day long kind of semi party and also playing the game and trying to get a bit more money in. Yeah. To get, yeah. You know, we, 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 we were about 10% over the target by the time we finished. Mm. It's that last day yeah. doing all of that. So next time you have an idea for a game, will you be crowdfunding it again? I don't know. I mean, like a lot of people who've done a Kickstarter campaign, you know, you don't you don't finish it thinking I can't wait to do that again. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it's a nerve wracking thing. Yeah. Um, I, I think I might. Yeah, it it's um it really depends on the concept. Um, it's clearly a thing that can work, but it does demand an immense amount of preparation. Yeah. Um, it's a, what it's, seems to happen is that when people do a second or a third Kickstarter or any crowdfunding campaign, they they obviously use that initial uh, backer base as leverage to to you know, kickstart the Kickstarter. Definitely. And people always find it easier, I think, to, to crowdfund a second or a third project. And you can kind of snowboard it a little bit over time. Mm. You can, yes. Um, when, you, when you've done one that's been a success, um, you can, yeah, you can exactly, as you yeah, said, kickstart the start. Kickstarter. Yeah. And that's that's what I would want to do. Um, yeah, you know, we're not we're certainly not planning to do one in the near future, mm. um, but we'll definitely look at it. Mm. But it felt like a battle. I mean, were you sleeping throughout the campaign? <laughs> yeah, I managed to sleep. Um, it, it was, uh, you know, it's very important when you do a Kickstarter campaign. After all the planning and getting your 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 project page lined up, you can't just leave it there static. Yeah. You have to keep it alive. You have yeah. to be adding to it. You have to be revealing things, you know, new tiers, new game mechanics, new partnerships. Mm. Uh, and you also have to be dropping in, you know, interviews, podcasts, mm -hmm. uh, show appearances. You have to have all this stuff lined up. Yeah. And as much as you're aware of this and prepare it in advance, it never feels like enough at the time. Yeah. Um, also, you want to be with, with something like a video game, you want to be showing progress during the campaign, yes. new things that you've been doing. It's not really practical to be focusing on developing the game as well as doing all this other stuff. Yeah. So you need to line it up in advance as much as possible. And then when it, you're actually going through the campaign and you're trying to drop all that stuff out, there's never you've never done enough uh, preparation. How personal do you think this project has become for you? What, what does TerraTech mean to you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it... Yeah, I, I suppose. I mean, I suppose it has become pretty, pretty personal. Um, th there was a there was a period uh, relatively early in the project. Um, I would say, you know, the first six to nine months after the Kickstarter, mm -hmm. um, when you know we'd got past that milestone and we were making a thing and we were starting to put it into an open beta phase and it was getting a bit of attention, but it wasn't selling all that strongly. It wasn't selling fast enough to actually cover our costs. Right, like we were still spending money. Or there, there were there were times like the launch, you know, when we when we did well and there was a surge, but that surplus, you know, starts to bleed away as as the sales aren't quite there. <laughs> so you go through this period um, where you know you believe in what you're doing, but you also know that time is running out if things don't start improving. Yeah. and obviously the doubt is there gnawing away at you. What if it doesn't improve? What if we just bleed out and then, you know, how am I going to do something? I, can I go back to Kickstarter and say, <laughs> well, it didn't work last time, but this time maybe, you know, or, or, or go and get a job. Um, I, I think it, it was a pretty scary thought that after coming this far, um, I might have to, I might just have to just, just, just go and work for someone else again. You know, that, that would be, that would be a, a very deflating thing to happen. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to say that I think we're out of that phase now. Mm. Um, you know, we've had slow but steady growth since we launched on uh, a thing called Early Access, which is a, a special um, category within Steam for games that are released in an unfinished state and developing all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we've, we've been on there since February, and it's been it's been going quite well. And then more recently, um, we've started to get some really good traction on YouTube. Uh, with 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 some prominent YouTubers playing the game and influencing other people, and the mm. sales have, have really surged since then. Mm. So yeah, it, it, it's great because you go from you go from a, a, a situation where you can look maybe two months ahead, and then you're not quite sure what's going to happen after that, mm. to being able to look six months ahead mm. and say, 
I'm confident that we have enough time to finish this game or not finish it because we hope we'll never finish it, but to get this game to a minimum level of completeness where we can call this a, a full mm. fully fledged product. Yeah. Mm. Um, so that's, that's a great place to be in. You have plans to bring the game to uh, handheld devices too? Screens. We do in the long term. Yeah. I mean, when, when, when originally, um, prototyping the concept, you know, there was that thought of, well, this system could work very well on touch screens. Mm. Um, you know, the, the mobile uh, market is is my, my recent background, seven years before this at, at IdeaWorks. Mm. Um, and I think it is you know, it's a place of huge opportunity, although equally huge competition and, and, and challenge. Yeah. So uh, the reason why we did not want to start in that market was we just thought that the, the problem of discovery in, in mobile is so immense that for a, an unknown group of guys doing a completely new thing to to get that exposure is a really massive mountain to climb right better to um better to release in the pc market which is a bit less turbulent and 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 smaller in terms of the um the numbers of new new products coming there yeah and better to work within the early access community and the kickstarter community to help us establish the game build it up tune it get it really solid and build awareness mm. And then we can use that as a platform. We go to mobile with something that a lot of people have heard of. Mm. And then you sell to Microsoft for 2.5 billion. At least, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Was that, that's, so when you look at the road ahead, so your campaign is behind you. Um, you're now, um, you're still building your community of, of uh, fans. Um, are, by the way, are those fans also, are they influencing the development of the game? Or do you feel? They are, absolutely. That is, in fact, a cornerstone of our, of our approach. Um, so, we update the build uh, very frequently. Every two weeks, we, we release an update to the game. Um, we have uh, multiple forums that people can get involved with. There's a forum on Steam. There's a forum of our own on our website. Um, we actually have a, an additional level of access um, that we sell as an add-on for people who really want to see the latest unstable content going in the game and who want to have a direct line to the developers to, to give feedback. Uh, and it's a we real inter- behind the scenes. Absolutely, yeah. And we, we, we interact constantly like with those unstable people. Unstable content. That sounds yeah. dangerous. Well, that's well it the, is. That's I mean, your next game. Yeah, well, it could be. Unstable well, it, it's content. this game, really. It's, I mean, you know, Terratech is a game about building uh, machines out of, out of parts, yeah. out of a large library of parts that we're constantly adding to. Mm. So the concept of our R&D pack, pack, the concept of our R&D pack, as we call it, is we have... Um, uh, an extra mode for the game in which um, players can experiment with building things out of all the parts that the game has, including all the experimental new parts that we are still testing before they get released to everyone oh, cool. else. So these new experimental parts, they tend to be in a rough and ready state. They'll be overpowered. So we'll have a <laughs> gun um, whose recoil is so strong that if you point it downwards, you'll shoot off the ground when you fire it. You know, uh, or we have a, a gyroscopic stabilizer that you can you can put onto something that's completely unstable and would normally fall over, and it will just kind of pick it back up again and make it wobble about in the air. Mm-hmm. And these things can have some quite unpredictable effects when you play mm-hmm. about with them. Mm-hmm. So we put them in the R and D chamber, and we get the R and D testers to play with it, which they enjoy, mm-hmm. and that tells us eh, maybe that recoils a bit too much, mm-hmm. yeah. or it tells us wow, mm. this could be a concept for a weapon that is also a form of propulsion. Mm-hmm. It's actually brilliant. We should, we should turn it up. You know, we, <laughs> we don't know until we've done that. So yeah. that's a, it's a really important process for us. And so people get in touch and they, they give their own ideas that you might want to incorporate in the game? They do, absolutely, yeah. They're, they're, they're very active yeah. um, on, the, on the forums. So You mentioned that you never want to finish the game. I mean, is there a sense of like... You know, if I were, were to say to you, when's the game done? When's the game coming out? Mm. The answer is... Well, the game is, is out already. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully in the next few months, it will it will come out of early access, which means that we will be officially calling it um, uh, a fully-fledged product, mm-hmm. but which does not mean that it's done. Uh, really, it's only done when it's no longer making any money, so we can't justified doing any more work on it yeah um but the hope would be that for many years we'll be able to continue evolving and adding to the product 
as long as we're getting good revenue for it. I mean, this is what happens with things like Minecraft. Mm. And that's the, that's the ideal that we're aiming for. Yeah. I I used to make um, adventure Stop. games. I used to like learn. My brother and I used to buy computer magazines, and one mm. just would read out the basic or whatever it was, and yeah. the others would type it in. Mm -hmm. And it's like every now and then a typo creeps in, and something weird happens in the game. Well, Pete, it's it insane. could be you know Russ and I interviewing you. If I'd continued on that game, I'd I'd have been sitting in that chair now. Well, in all <laughs> seriousness, this is that's why I'm sitting in this chair. Yeah. I mean, that's that's how I started, right? I used to make stuff on my BBC, yeah. and that got me fascinated with the process. And, you know, there's a strong argument that I owe my career to that. And that's why some of the luminaries in the industry, people like David Braben, the guy behind Elite uh, and the new, new one, mm. uh, are such champions for getting modern equivalents of that kind of technology into the hands of children, into schools, yeah. all these projects like the Raspberry Pi and other kinds of things, you know, because as, as the technology got more advanced in the previous 20 odd years, yeah those things started to disappear and they became purely entertainment devices. Mm. Uh, and there wasn't the same mm. way to, to sort of transition from playing to learning and making, yeah. which has been so important to so many of us. How old were you when you first made your first game? Well, yeah, I, I, I made games when I was, I guess, 12 mm -hmm. on my BBC. Mm -hmm. and they weren't very good or they generally weren't finished. Yeah. What was your, the first game you made? I can't remember. Well, I, th I made a, I made a quiz game where it just asked a load of questions and, uh, you had to get the right answers. I, I think I did a platformer. I was, I was trying to make a, a version of street fighter for my mm -hmm. BBC, which oh, didn't, wow. didn't work too well. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty ambitious. It was a bit too ambitious. <laughs> well, what, what's the equivalent right now? What, what, can kids do, you said Raspberry Pi, I guess, but I mean, what, what are kids using in, instead of? There are several kinds of initiative at the moment for getting actual coding exposure yeah. for kids. And there is a new product that I heard of quite recently. I can't remember the name, um, which is, is something a bit like that. It's just a, a physical device yeah. that you can program on and you can use it, you know, to do home automation or to make games or to yeah. do anything, anything you like. I think I'm right in saying that the BBC are about to release another computer. Really? Yeah, I read it the other day and I was really surprised. I always thought it was strange that they launched the computer anyway back in the day. But I think they've, they've got a Raspberry Pi-like device, mm. unless I've misread something. There, there are a pro proliferation of those kinds of things at the moment. The Raspberry Pi was a high-profile one, but there are several others, mm. um, which is very exciting. I just, I just hope that there is a way to get them into the hands of, of kids yeah. um, because that's, that's what needs to happen. It's very easy now to just to have an Xbox and play games on it. Mm -hmm. If it had been that easy when I was a kid, I might not have got into programming yeah, at all. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. And how young are some of the players of Terratech? Oh, it goes down to seven, six even. Yeah. Um, much younger than we had in mind when we started developing it. Um, they go with guns. I mean, every six-year-old... I think that's what's great about it. It's because it's, I looked at uh, someone playing the game on YouTube, and I was thinking, actually, I'm not being much of a gamer, really. Um, I thought that looks like fun. I mean, it really does look like a, a sort of fun way to, to mm. spend some time. Yeah, that's very much what we. <laughs> that's were going a great for. review, Pete. Yeah, well, we'll fun way to spend some time. <laughs> fun way. I recommend Terra. <laughs> you, you can put that, that on quote? the back of the box. <laughs> yeah. 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 Fun well, way have to a spend photo some of your time. face with a speech <laughs> bubble. Peter Dean says it's a fun way to spend time, kids. <laughs> yeah, that could have been me. You know. That <laughs> So, Russ, you ran a successful campaign. What advice do you have for anyone out there, whether individuals or companies, who want to start their own campaign? Can you give us your tips for crowdfunding success? Well, uh, probably the first thing to point out, which won't be a surprise to most people, is just get ready to work very, very hard, not just uh, not just for the, the month or however long you set the campaign, but all the, all the lead up to it. Um, in terms of specific things, um, I, I should mention that... Um, most of the kind of tips that you can give are really about preparation as much as anything else because mm -hmm. the Kickstarter campaign is all in the preparation and all the stuff that is really good to do while it's live has to be prepared. Um, so one thing I'd single out is cross-promotion. Um, as I, I forget if I mentioned this before, but it's really the success potential is a function of the quality of what you can offer and the, the social reach that you can achieve and cross-promoting with other friendly friendly developers or just friendly people in general um, is a great way to do that so um, you want to be um, 
you want to be finding you know like-minded souls developers in the same situation as yourself or or, or people at a different kind of station for example we were very lucky in that we were able to connect with the guys from elite dangerous which had a extraordinarily successful campaign um they you know they liked the project and they promoted us a bit to to their backers also uh double fine we got a contact with a with a guy at double fine um obviously they did their double fine adventure which at the time set, set a record tim schaefer yeah that's right so um they uh they gave us a, a little shout in one of their backer updates that was that was really good for us yeah um yeah and um you know in, in a way the the in-game uh kickstarter link button that we put in was a form of cross promotion because we were attracting people who had just checked out the game on a on a, on a website mm. to actually become aware that this is something that they could um that they could get involved in in a deeper way it's really about connecting different different social groups together um so that's an important thing um it is very important as we were talking about before um to keep a campaign alive constantly fresh you need to have a constant stream of events reveals announcements whether it's new features that you're going to put in the game new people you're going to collaborate with uh, stretch goals um, or just you know interviews and podcasts and show appearances all that stuff has to be organized occasionally some things will come along unplanned but mostly you have to have it lined up weeks in advance uh, if you're going to you know drop an article on gamma sutra which is a popular game development focused website that's a useful thing to do again you don't want to be writing that you know on week three of your campaign while you're trying to do everything else you need mm-hmm. to have that queued up yeah ready ready to go um and in general with that the timing of things is very important we, we talked earlier on about the the timing of our steam demo uh, becoming available which frankly rescued our campaign um i'd love to say that we had planned it to work exactly like that we hadn't really mm-hmm. but i wish we had um it, it's really important to think about when the timing of lining things up together can create more momentum than either of the two things on their own. Mm-hmm. Another example from our campaign was doing the the final, well, not the final, but the main Twitch stream and AMA on Reddit at the same time. Mm. Each of those things on its own um, would have helped a little bit, but doing them together created much more energy, mm. um, which was very important to us. Mm. Yeah, that's a good tip. I mean, in some respects, it sounds like so you were prepared, but you were also very much reactive. I mean, learning as you went. Is that fair to say? Absolutely, yeah. You you have to be be able to react to things again, which is why it's so important to do the preparation so that you're not distracted by that um, when you when you need to react. And and you know, I suppose that philosophy um, expands to the whole of our development approach with with Terratech. We tried to balance having a direction that we like and preparing for that with maintaining a degree of flexibility so that we can react to what the community likes, what they don't like, what unforeseen opportunities come up along the way before we wrap up uh, i also like to hear your guest pick so this is where uh you tell us about another crowdfunding campaign whether past or present that you think is cool for whatever reason yeah so there is a campaign that i'm quite excited about at the moment it's um it is for a vr based game uh which is called pixel ripped mm-hmm. um and it's uh good name it, it's it's a it's a fun name. It's that that is a name that's been through a few adventures. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's really interesting, not just for the the, the concept of it. Uh, the, the concept of it is um, it is a VR virtual reality experience. You, you put the the, uh, the goggles on, and you're you're a kid in a classroom uh, with a boring lesson. Your teacher's explaining something, and um, while you're in this lesson, you uh, you have a, a Game Boy. Uh, actually, it's a Game Girl. I think, yes. But it's you know it's the same thing. Uh, that you're looking down at and you're trying to play this game within a game on your on your Game Boy, except when the teacher looks at you, you have to hide it, <laughs> otherwise you get in trouble. Yes, And then yeah. you have to put it back out again. And you're so, in the virtual world, you're looking down at this thing, and there's all sorts of other stuff yeah. distracting you going on in the classroom. Um, and then uh, as you play the game, when you get to the end of the level, there's a, there's a boss uh, fight that you have to deal with, uh, and it, it actually comes out of the, the Game Girl oh. into the classroom, uh, and I can't call it the real world because there's another <laughs> real world outside that. But right. um, you, you have to sort of deal with this and the real world, the, the virtual real world starts to 
blend into the the virtual virtual world and you have to deal with this whole thing it's 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 not as mind-bending as it sounds do you know what i've seen this yeah um and it sounds so cool it is cool and you know what one of the things that's nice about it is that's got a sense of humor Mm. you know like you see some of these vr things virtual reality things and they're quite dark or gloomy and or they're playing you know horror Mm. psychological terror and that's you know you can understand why they're trying that out with vr but this one was it's quite playful as a sense of humor Mm. which is unusual i think it's also made by two women it is made by two amazing women, yeah. um, and that is the other part of what makes it such an exciting project. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're great characters. Uh, Anna Ribeiro, the sort of uh, original concept, uh, she, um, she's a Brazilian who previously uh, worked as a pie seller and uh, <laughs> pivoted into, into making video games. Good pivot. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty, she's, she's wow. an amazing person, and uh, Steph Keegan working with her on the project. They're, they're absolutely great. Um, I think they... I think, you know, the project as a Kickstarter project is going to be a bit of a struggle for them because yeah. um, because it's VR. Mm. Uh, you know, one trend that you see when you look at video game Kickstarters is it tends to be in some senses a, a pre-sales platform, mm. which is not really aligned with the, the ethos of what Kickstarter is about. Mm-hmm. You know, in the early days, uh, it was much more about you know, help this thing become a reality and more, more, more donations really. Um, but the, the sort of the trend really for video games is it tends to be used as a pre-sales thing. Uh, and that makes it difficult for something like VR, which no one's, no one's really got yet except for mm-hmm. developers, yeah. um, which is, which is a bit of a shame. Yeah. So I, I don't, I would love for if it, I would love for this project to make it. Yeah. I don't know if it will. I'm sure they'll come back and, have another go or do something else. So the name of the game is Pixel Ripped or the name of the company? The name of the game is Pixel Ripped. I am not sure if they have a company name or okay. if it's different. Right. But that's that's the name to look for. And, and the campaign is on Kickstarter. It is on Kickstarter and it's uh, it's really worth taking a look at. Well, we'll give them a shout out. Uh, if yeah. This, if this yeah. airs post I'm, I'm the campaign, we'll, sounds we'll, so much fun. we'll do what we can. Uh, yeah, they're, they're a neat team. Good, good, good guest pick. Yeah, us. definitely. Does that make you think of VR for Terratech? Or have you been thinking about it? We have thought about it a little bit. It's funny. Um, the, the state of VR at the moment is so early and so evolving that uh, y- you can you can get some ideas about it and then find that um, a, a month later, your ideas have totally flipped. Mm. Um, when we first started, obviously when, when, when Oculus and everything became massive not so long ago, uh, everyone was like, oh, you could do this VR. Why don't you do Terratech VR? And we mm. thought, well... How's that going to work? You know, you'll be first person inside this cab of the vehicle, presumably. You'll be looking around and how will the camera control work? Terratech sort of relies on being able to see the whole environment around your vehicle. We can't really, mm. it just doesn't seem to fit. And then one of the things we've people have been saying recently is that it seems that a lot of the VR games that are very first person oriented are actually quite disorienting to play and quite stressful to play. Mm. And one uh, approach that works unexpectedly well is what they call a diorama mode, mm-hmm. where you take a game that might be a two-dimensional game, a platform or something, and you you put it in a three-dimensional virtual reality space with the player as a sort of suspended observer. So you see the action mm. like a little diorama, and you control it as if it was, say, a two-dimensional game, but you're just there watching it from a three-dimensional VR perspective. Yeah. And that is actually quite close to the way that Terratech plays already. But you see yourself. You don't see yourself, no. You you're you're hanging in the world right. like like a a camera, like a floating camera or gotcha. something. And you just you just play the thing. Yeah. Um you know that that would work that would that would adapt almost instantly to, to Terratech and it might work really well. So it is something that we started to think about a little more seriously. Christmas time, VR sets for not, Terratech. Yeah, well, not this Christmas. On, so I can, I can tell you that. They're busy. <laughs> Keep on listening to something. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't really need any more distractions at the moment. But uh, I don't know. I don't know what can happen. I mean, uh, uh, one or two of the, the VR companies have actually contacted us recently. So yeah. we'll see what they have to yeah. say. I mean, with your, do you look ahead for the, like five years from now? Or are, you, are you that kind of guy who thinks this is the game plan? Um, to an extent, uh, you know, if I've learned anything from this experience is that any plan that you make, you know, even even one year from now, mm. w- it won't work out that way. You know, things mm. things things change. And we 
we have built that flexibility to change into our whole development approach. Yeah. Um, so I don't plan in too much detail. Uh, I, I have some, we, we have a roadmap with some important milestones on it yeah. that are one, two years off yeah. um, with the awareness in parallel that those things could change order or move or go in a different direction. I mean, you've come a long way from a couple of years ago when it was, you know, without the idea and then that spark of the idea. I mean, you must look back and go, it's a wild ride. Is there something that you're most proud of? Um, it has been an incredible ride. Um, I think the thing that I'm most proud of is the team. You know, I walk into the office now and I think about when it first, when it was first just, just two guys sitting in one little boxy room um, telling ourselves that this was a proper job, <laughs> you know, and, and now I, I go to work and there's eight of us and there'll probably be 10 by the end of the year. Um, and they're just this, this amazing, talented group of people who just work together really well. And I still have to pinch myself that, that all this came from that. You know, it's, it's brilliant. Listen, before you go, um, and it's been great speaking with you, Russ, um, can you leave us with some words of wisdom? Is there a quote that inspires you? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible at remembering quotes and jokes and things like that. But there, there is a, a quote that, that I quite like. Um, it's usually attributed to Mark Twain, but I recently learned that um, it was actually, it was a guy called... Uh, Robert Burnett, who was a 19th century humorist, and somebody along the line appropriated that quote and, and, and gave it to Mark Twain. Yeah, so, and the quote is, um, don't believe that the world owes you a living, the world owes you nothing, it was here first. <laughs> Very good. I, I think that's a useful yeah. thing, especially for people like us, for indie developers, to to keep in mind, you know, you won't get anywhere by just sort of, just just waiting for your success to happen. You have to work harder than you thought you knew how to work in order to, to make it happen. I think that's very true of crowdfunding as well. Any crowdfunding <laughs> campaign. So Russ, where can people go online to find out more about TerraTech and buy a copy of the game? Oh, sure. Yes, we, we'd love everyone to do that. Um, so they can go to our website, which is terratechgame.com, uh, or they can just search for TerraTech on, on steam.com. It's T E R R A. T E C H. Uh, we'd also always encourage people to come and join our, our Twitch streams, uh, Twitch TV, twitch.tv slash Terratech Game. We broadcast um, pretty much every day from 5 p.m. UK time. Sometimes earlier in the afternoons, we'll broadcast just some art modeling or a bit of programming, whatever's going on. Hmm. It's a great way to kind of get a feel for who we are and how we do it and meet some of our other community members. That's interesting because earlier you were talking about being that 12 year, old, 12 year old kid making games. I can imagine that there are some of those 12 year old kids watching Twitch TV. There definitely are. Uh, and we, we, we know some of them quite well. Right. And it's a good point, actually, that maybe that is partly filling the gap, you know, of, of the way uh, things, things used to work there. Um, I've been absolutely bowled over by the response that we get from some of these people because, you know, a lot of them just, just didn't really have any understanding of of uh, how a game is made and they find it immensely exciting. I, I, they, they're incredibly impressed by what seems to us the simplest of things. You know, I'll be, I'll be doing a bit of programming on the stream and I'm actually feeling quite embarrassed about how badly I'm coding or how I'm failing to solve the problem. Yeah. And then you get these comments of just pure adulation yeah. from the guys in the chat mm-hmm. who just, they, they can see a wall of code and they just think that's so amazing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite humbling. That's got to keep you going though. Yeah. Definitely. Well, your story is inspiring and we are really grateful for the time you gave us today. Yep. Thanks for us. No problem. It was my absolute pleasure. So you've been listening to Crowd Scene, the show about successful crowdfunding campaigns and the people who make them happen. Our huge thanks to our guest Russ Clark of Payload Studios for his time and insights in this episode. To find out more about Russ and TerraTech, please visit TerraTechGame.com. That's T-E-R-R-A-T-E-C-H-G-A-M-E.com. If you're enjoying this podcast, a positive review on iTunes actually helps us reach more listeners. So thanks for your help in spreading the word. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to Crowd Scene on iTunes or any of your favorite podcast apps. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach us at hello at crowdsceneshow.com. Or to hear about upcoming guests on the show, please follow Crowd Scene on Twitter or Facebook at Crowd Scene Show. 
Pete and I want to say thank you as always to singer-songwriter Kim Bookbinder for the theme music for Crowd Scene. To find out more about Kim, please check out kimbookbinder.com. Special thanks to our friend Jim Fowler and his expert ears. For more on Jim, visit jimfowlermusic.com. So until next episode, thanks for listening. Cool epic.